Guys, we have the answer to so many questions. And I, and I know our friends in Washington, D.C. have taken up all of the news time. Um, but do you, do you realize today the church has the answers for that disaster? Because Jesus Christ is not on the throne here. He's on the throne there. But I'm still a seminary student, and uh, some of the students that I study with online are in the Philippines. And it is not getting really much news time at all. But they have a volcano going off up there, but they're not even sure it may still go. I mean, kaboom, boom. If it goes, it'd be, it could be the equivalent of a nuclear bomb going off, and we're just not hearing about it. Do we have the theological answers for that? Does the church know why? I mean, they're tempted to go, oh, well, because maybe God's punishing them. Wrong. Wrong. No. This is a broken planet, it is cursed. And there are aftershocks, aftershocks even to the, to the flood we read about in the Genesis account. This is a cursed and fallen world. Who has the answers? Raise your hand. Or corporately, we should raise our hand. The church has the answers. Why are things so bad in D.C.? Why are things so bad in the Philippines? Well, there's a new virus starting to draw some attention because it's here. Another person was diagnosed with this coronavirus thing in, in Orange County. It's going to spread. Who has the answers for that? We do. We have the answers as the church of Christ collectively. We have those answers. And so I, I just wanted to take a, a little bit of a break this week uh, from Luke, although we're pulling the concepts and ideas that we've been studying, right? Because Israel has basically created a dynamic where their people said no. And Jesus, he knew that, but fine, the decision was real. He begins to invest in the 12. That's what we've been looking at. And he gave them all sorts of admonitions, warning, consequences, all these things he brought to the table because he is preparing them to be the church the church ministry, this, this organization, this organism, this body that will travel the world proclaiming that the most vile wretch you could possibly fathom could repent, that is to change his mind, realize he's wrong, put his faith in Jesus Christ, and then sit with a local body of believers and proclaim how great he is, yes, but proclaim that he, despite being an utter train wreck, can stand faultless before the throne. And so as these men were, were challenged and, and sent out and to proclaim the gospel, they took those that believed and they broke them into groups. And those are the groups we want to look at today. But as Israel made its decision and as Jesus began to really invest in these 12, he made it clear. Luke does not record this, but Matthew does. He says this in Matthew chapter 16. He takes the 12 up, a little camping trip, so to speak, up into northern Israel. And he begins to ask, who do people say that I am? Right? Popular question today, all sorts of silly answers. But verse 16, Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Messiah. Or some of your translations may say, you are the Christ. It's referring to the same thing. You're the one, this entire book from Genesis chapter 3, you're the one to crush the devil. You're, this is your story. This is your book. You're the one, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And he says, and I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. There it is. Really the first mention of the church in the New Testament. Totally foreign concept in the Old. Why was it foreign? Why was it not introduced? Because if it introduced that way, then Israel's decision was not real. It was all predetermined that they would reject him. God had all the pieces in place had they accepted Christ and had they not. That's why John is Elijah on one hand, but not on the other. Everything was in place for them to make a decision, and they had. And Jesus says, I'm going to build my church. The word for church, exit, to ex, we draw from the Greek, and then ecclesia is a group, a cluster group. So they would go and they would proclaim the gospel. And those who believe in a sense, they exited and they began to gather together. Now Peter does mean rock in a sense, but Peter means pebble. So there's a play on words here. What is the true rock? We go back into the Old Testament. Isaiah chapter 44, 
Verse 6 says this, Thus says the Lord, there's all caps, that means we're talking about Yahweh. Thus says Yahweh, the King of Israel, and His Redeemer, the Yahweh of hosts. Two individuals, both identifying by Isaiah as Yahweh, are about to make a statement. What do two individuals say? I am the first and I am the last. There is no God besides me. And if you get in the book of Revelation, really cool, because they've translated, I'm the Alpha and the Omega. That is recorded as coming from the Father. It is also recorded as coming from the Son. And there's your plural nature of the triune God. Jesus Christ is every bit Yahweh as his Father is. So you have two individuals here that say Yahweh and Yahweh the Redeemer. Sorry, I couldn't bypass that verse. I just personal favorite. But then they say this in verse 8 of Isaiah 44, do not tremble, do not be afraid. Did I not proclaim this and foretell it long ago? You are my witnesses. Is there any God besides me? No, there is no other rock. I know not one. Who is the rock with respect? Peter, you were the man in a sense. Good for you. Got the keys, did your thing. But the rock is Christ Himself. The rock is who He is. And that is the foundation from which He will build His church. When Jesus Christ left, it's recorded in all of the Gospels, and it's recorded again in the book of Acts. But He told them, Go into all the world and preach the Gospel to all creation. That is what these men were to do. It worked. And it's working. And, ounce of gratitude, you and me are a product of them taking this pretty serious. In fact, they took it so serious, it cost them their lives. But how does this body function? Well, I could write a book on it, okay? So I've just decided I want to talk about in 2020, just a little bit as we launch into our business meeting and into our church, how does this thing work together? And so we're going to spend some time today in the book of Ephesians. So if you have your Bibles and you want to follow along with me, we'll be in Ephesians chapter 4. And this is some of what we see about the makeup of the church, the New Testament church. It is not the equivalent of a parking meter. Did you pay your dues? No, not at all. It's not something you have to do to keep your sanity. It is an an organism. It is something that as you believe, you become a part of. So we're kind of catching a mid-context a little bit here. But Paul, as he writes, he talks about Christ having come down and he gifted and, and then he ascended and so forth. But then verse 11, he says this. He says, so Christ himself gave the apostles the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. Who did Christ himself give it to? Give it to us. He gave it to the church, right? So he is, and we sang it today, he is the cornerstone, the slab, if you will, what holds the entire weight of this structure. But the structure is a metaphor. And I love it that no one here really has said, when do we move into our new church? We are the church. The question is, when do we move into our new church? facility, which is where the church will meet. It will be a hub of function and a hub of encouragement and all these other things. But you and me, we make up the church. So he gave himself to the apostles. They built on the foundation or on the cornerstone that is Christ. Now apostles in one sense means sent ones. But it was also an office, an office that no longer exists today. They were the apostle, these 12 men. Judas was out, Paul was in, these 12 apostles. Then he mentions the prophets. We do see the prophets in the early church, but for the most part, the prophets of the early church ceased, stopped to function that way once the scriptures had come. I was invited this week for the gazillionth time. I finally had to tell this person, no more. I'm not going to some place in LA to hear this lady who's a modern day prophet give me the inside scoop. You do not need a prophet. Everything that God has said to you is in this book. You might need help navigating this book. You might need help studying this book. But you do not need some lady who claims some audible revelation from God to tell you how to fix yourself. That stuff is going on all the time. 
talk to the hand. Not interested. In fact, with all due respect, lady, please stop sending me this because I'm going to rebuke it every single time. Is this book sufficient? Yes. And when it became sufficient, God said, those offices are done. Okay, even as the apostles were towards the end of their life, Paul could bear hug a dead guy and poof, pop back up. Walk through their shadow, you were healed. End of their life, pray for so-and-so, he's not doing so good. Well, what happened to you, Slick? You can't fix him anymore? You can see the slowly transition and these offices and the gifts that came with them are gone. But what we do still have is evangelists, pastors, teachers. Now the Greek grammar is unclear whether pastor or teacher is like hyphenated or is it separate. I tend to think it's separate, but I base it on experience. Because I've studied under some guys that I don't think you'd want to pastor your church for one minute. But you talk about brilliant. I have a professor now. I took courses twice as deep as I needed to and asked the school to just dismiss an elective and let me take every single class this guy has to take. He's a medical doctor, became a hand surgeon, decided rather than teach other people to do surgery on hands, he went to seminary and got a master's in divinity, went to another seminary, got a master's in theology, went to Oxford to get a PhD. He is now world-renowned, the leader on St. Augustine in the church today. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. I, as a pastor, get the privilege to study underneath him. I went to Israel in 2010 with a doctor, Arnold Fruchtenbaum, and I got to sit at the same table with him. I'm thinking, what an opportunity. This is going to be like a sponge in front of this guy. I sat there all excited, opened up his newspaper, and never said a word to me. I just have to stick with his books. In other words, he's not this personable guy, but he's brilliant. Do you see the different offices working together? I'm not as brilliant, but I'd probably be a little bit more fun to go bowling with or something. I don't know. <laughs> I love these guys. The body of Christ is so diverse and God has gifted so many men and so many women in so many ways. This is what we have. This helps us be all that we need to be as a body. And he, he moves on from there. The purpose of that is to equip his people, that's you, for works of service. But works is a bad word, isn't it? No. Only if they put it in front of your salvation. Only if they hinge your salvation on it. It's not a bad word. You were designed to function on the earth because Jesus isn't here. You can't go and grab hold of Him. You grab hold of His body, which is the church. And we have to be a moving functioning, living, serving organism on this earth. We have to be. At least in our area of influence. In the second half of verse 12, to equip His people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Now it doesn't jump off the pages in English as much as it does in the original Greek language, but there's no connection there back to the evangelist, back to the pastor, back to the teacher. In other words, this is not my job description completely. I'm part of the body. It's part of it. But no, the pastor teacher equips the saints, so in turn they do the works of service, and then in turn the body of Christ is built up. In other words, don't dismiss this and go, well, that's what we pay him for. No, no, this is something spoken to all of us. Do we understand that? Yes, we want to be equipped. And yes, we want to be teaching and evangelizing and doing all these things, but all of this, the body builds the body. That's what he's saying to us through this text. Until when? Until we all reach unity in the faith. And that, when you see the faith in the New Testament like that, it's the body of doctrine handed down to the church through the apostles. The faith is what they called it. Later when they wanted it expressed, it became known as the Apostles' Creed, but that was the foundation of it. That doctrine that was handed down, you go, oh, doctrine's not important. 
Doctrine just divides. That's your doctrine. And it's not real good. Doctrine is huge. The doctrine here is that you can, by faith alone in Christ, stand faultless before the throne. That sums our doctrine up as well as anything else I could possibly say. Through faith alone in the crucified and risen Lord Jesus Christ. That's our doctrine. And we're going to say, oh, that's not important. Oh, yes, it is. We want to get clear on that. Unity of faith. What else is important? Knowledge of the Son of God. Knowledge. That isn't, you don't get knowledge when you believe. You have some of the basics down. Knowledge speaks of depth. And there's nothing greater, even if they don't have some theological degree. I have to admit, as I think about it, besides the, you know, the profs I like to study under, when I want to go and get advice I want somebody who knows Jesus, not from a textbook, not from Oxford, not with PhDs, but a guy has just walked with Jesus for 30 years and knows Jesus and has seen things that I'm struggling with and can invest in me. That's knowledge. It doesn't come from a book. It comes from the depth of intimacy with Jesus. It comes from a guy who for 30 years has got up poured a cup of coffee, sat down with the Scriptures and come to know Jesus who's done ministry, who's been in the thick of things and He has knowledge. That's where we want to get to the Son of God and become mature. Spiritual maturity. It's lacking in so many circles. The purpose of the church is to get together, not to put a token in a meter, but to make sure that we know Jesus, that we know doctrine, that we can articulate the gospel, that we can proclaim the words of eternal life, that we can offer wisdom and insight in everything that a lost, hurting world needs. And I'm going to step into this and step back out, but I don't think you get there through a radio program. I don't think you get there. And in other words, how important is gathering with other saints at church to gain this maturity, insight, and knowledge? It's absolutely critical. With our goal, it continues on, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Oh, good luck with that. That means nobody's arrived. The full measure. Could you measure all His wisdom? Could you measure all His holiness? Could you measure His perfection? Could you measure Him up and then try and and go, yeah, me and Jesus were the same? Yeah, probably not. But are you locked in to that idea and concept that you would begin to become more and more like Jesus? I mean, we get so wrapped up in, in predestination, no another doctrine, but that in Romans chapter 8, when he says we've predestined, predestined to be what? To be conformed to his image. It's the same thing, same writer. That's what he wants. He wants to take selfish unbelievers. They come to faith. It's not a microwave. You're not fixed overnight, but over time, more and more and more, you go, I, that person spent some time with Jesus. That person is looking more and more Christ-like. That's the goal. Is the absolute fullness that we become like Jesus. Do we serve people like Jesus did? Do we pay a price to bless somebody else like Jesus did? Even if you don't like them. Even if you can't stand them. Even if they're your enemy. It's biblical. Love them. Serve them. Pay a price to be the blessing in their life. Does your love look like His love? Does your kindness look like His kindness? Does your compassion look like His compassion? Does your holiness look like His holiness, His humility, His unselfishness, His servant attitude, His ability to forgive, His ability to minister to people, His ability to find potential in the absolute lowest of lows, the most despicable, Jesus saw something. What did He see? He saw somebody made in the image of God that was absolutely redeemable, who was absolutely forgivable. We don't write off anybody. Jesus didn't. That's why Our religious friends from yesteryear hated his guts because he wouldn't shun the unholy. 
He sat with the unholy. He forgave the unholy. He loved the unholy. And he's betting that love, that grace, the same grace that I hope rock your soul, will rock theirs and draw them into the process at which they believe join a church and grow. That's the New Testament gamble, as it's been heard before. And what a gamble it is to completely empty yourself for the sake of something most people would consider despicable. That's the function of the church. I know I said this a few weeks ago, but it's coming. We are going to be faced with a generation that bought into the idea and essentially neutered and castrated themselves, pursuing the most pathetic, horrific, despicable agenda you could possibly imagine. When they snap out of that and they start looking for answers, why is there a volcano in the Philippines? Why is there a virus? Why was I born a boy and now I'm not? What happened? The church has the answers, but the church can't just theologically go, well, let's see, that would fall under the doctrine of total depravity. No. The church would embrace them and love them, and I don't have the answers sitting here. Lord, have mercy. How do we disciple and navigate that one? Don't know. Had a friend pastoring a church, came to find out the husband and wife used to be the wife and the husband. I got nothing to offer, man. I don't don't know. Just flat out, like, call the elders. (laughs) Put it on them. Anyway, I'm not making light of this. We are going to have to love and embrace a generation that is so tweaked by some form of... Let's go back to Ephesians. Ah fullness of Christ. Moves on in verse 14. When this happens, we will no longer be infants, spiritual infants, tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. And you know what? I did just, you know, I try and navigate the original languages every week and wind is the same word for spirit. So I don't know if it's wind or it's a spirit, a dark spirit who would love nothing more than to draw you out of a healthy relationship in a church and have you chasing this latest prophet who's showing up at the Staples Center or whatever the case might be. There are deceitful men. There is a lot, and I mean a lot of money to be made in religion. The biggest church in the United States today is led by, I'm sorry, but my job title is pastor, which means shepherd the sheep a little bit. It is led by an absolute heretic. He is not going to proclaim the message that, I mean, this is not biblical at all. And when the camera turns in, there's 20 to 25,000 people cheering him on. They have been led astray. And I tell you, of all the things that would just pierce my heart is to find out a member of this church or someone who sits under my teaching bought into that. That would tell me that I haven't spent enough time doing what the text of Ephesians says. But then again, wait a minute. This isn't spoken just to me. This is spoken to all of us. So that means if one of us rises up and decides, you know what? If I go and give this guy $500, I'm going to get $50,000 next year. Protect ourselves and protect those (coughs) in our body. People and their deceitful scheming. (coughs) Excuse me. Instead of that, speaking the truth in love. And there is times where in order to do that, in order to shepherd, in order to encourage one another, we actually have to say difficult things. I don't like it. I really don't. I just, you know, I think that's the part where we once again call the elders. <laughs> no, we have to speak the truth in love to one another. Because most of the time where repentance is used in the New Testament, it is not written to the world. It is written to the church. And if we get off and we are not off track and we are not willing to speak into one another's lives, what a shame. 
It is. It is an absolute shame. And that is an invitation for you to speak into mine as well. I'm not on a pedestal. I, I'm not. I'm susceptible to this too. And one of the things I, I love is I get together on Saturdays and I kind of lead things, but I try and take off my little pastor hat as if I had one. I'm one of the guys. And all of my struggles are real. All of my issues are real. And we're, we're, we should be in a, a somewhat open book to one another. That requires proper doctrine too. Because you can't be an open book or an environment when you spill a little bit of what rocks your week and then suddenly you're classified, oh, well, you're an unbeliever then. They probably wouldn't say it that way, but trust me, that's what they're thinking. No, we want an open environment where there's no shame, there's no condemnation. Trust me, if you struggle with it, you're not the only one. But, as we share, we want to grow. To become in every respect the mature body of Him who is the head, that is Christ. Once again, maturity. It is a lifelong process. You are not getting there because you got baptized and made some commitment. It's commitment theology, I really, it really, really, really concerns me. You are this. Commit yourself to Christ. Into the dunk tank, out of the dunk tank, and oh, everything's better now. A couple weeks ago, I, I showed that video about the two rooms. Remember that? The room of good intentions. Everyone wore a mask. That leads to the room of good intentions in the mask. Committed, unbaptized, all those things I'm not supposed to do anymore. Boy, they don't find out I still do. So do they. So do they. What an open and honest church. Sure, discretion is advised in certain circles, but that's why we want opportunities to get together and so forth. We want to grow. And it's from Him, the whole body is joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Think about that. It's not putting it on me. Did you catch that? It's not. This week will mark, I believe, the 15th, I lost it, or 16th anniversary of the date that we left to go be missionaries in Papua New Guinea. Wow. Lost track of that. Long time. And just my memories just come flooding. But one of the neatest times we moved into the Sino village is we began to build a home. There was a home there from some previous missionaries who couldn't stay and we were just going to move their home, move into their old home, would have been a lot cheaper, etc. But the foundation was not solid. They didn't go deep enough and really solidify the foundation. And so the concern was, you get little 4.0s every three or four days there, a little bit of rocking and rolling. And so the decision was made, now you, you guys are here, you have three young kids, you need to build a home. So it was a really, really neat time. My wife got to design her own house. Who gets to do that? And we got to build it. But I remember in the building process, we would take these logs and our, almost our entire home was built out of jungle material. So these great big logs would go into the ground and they stood up. But then we connected them with these floor joists that went this way. And then the floor joists went that way. And the joist going this way held, even though it was massive tree at one point, it held what went this way. And then what went this way held what went this way, which held, which went up and down. We had like a Lincoln log house. And it was still a little shaky. Like, no, one thing we did do is we had this canoe come up. It was quite a sight to see and brought in plywood. What the plywood did is when the plywood went into the joist, it joined everything, even the posts that were going up and down. It was like a strap and the house got more and more stable. Then we took other tree branches and we began to build our home out of those. And we built up and up and up all the way to a thatch roof, which is like palm branch roof. And the palm branches had pieces of bamboo. And if you cut it just right, it becomes a rope. And it would interweave into the thatch, into the moretta, around the logs. But the logs were connected to other logs, which were connected to the floor, which went all the way to the ground. And our home was intricately and, and forever tied together. Each part had a purpose. And it all held. It's that same idea. We didn't look at this thing and go, well, all of it is hinged upon one component. Right? Is all of it hinged upon like a really, really good speaking pastor? I mean, 
I have aspirations to be better at what I do. Nothing wrong with that, but so many times like, ooh, that big guy goes and the whole thing comes crumbling down. It shouldn't. It shouldn't. This body, just like our home in the jungle, should lock in. And it should be solid when it's done. Rock solid. And we did. We'd get the earthquakes and I could feel them, but I never felt so secure in that house. Well, that's not, that's not true. Unless the lightning was coming. Have you ever seen lightning come? Maybe some Midwest people here? Oh my. I could see it coming from the distance and I knew the pattern it was taking. It was coming right for me every time the lightning was coming. i disconnect the radio. And if it was late at night, which it usually was, cowered under my one blanket like a baby praying. You, I mean, if you have not heard lightning strike all the way and it even hit our home one time and took a seven-inch nail that we used to drive through those floor joists and popped it out of the hardwood like it was a cork of wine. Sorry, back to the text. It was just motivate your prayer life. <laughs> but the point is, is that this entire structure, guys, we are that structure. And when the storms come, can the branch rely on the log? Can the log stay dry because of the roof? And can the people inside have a sense of security because it's all held together? That'd be a pretty good church, wouldn't it? I think that's what Paul is saying. But here's the problem. This is one little problem. And again, I'm navigate this delicately, but so many times even Jesus is declared to you that you ask him into your heart or into your life. And you hear things like, we can have a personal relationship with Jesus. And it's true because I'm not going to be there in the morning with your coffee. You don't need me there. So there's a certain amount of truth to it. But what happens then is it becomes the, the solo independent Christian, not the corporate Christian so you want a vertical and a horizontal relationship with Jesus Christ. Both. Do people speak into your life? Or is it just you alone? I think that's what he tells the, the Hebrews. He's like, in 10, Hebrews 10, he says, let us consider how we may spur on one another towards love and good deeds. And, and yes, there was no Facebook then, but I don't think the plan was that you just do that on social media. But you go, well, I don't need to be a part of a structural home. I'm solid on my own. What a shame. What an arrogant shame that would be. No, he says, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. And even then, I had a little bit more compassion towards those who didn't gather then. Why? Because you never knew when it was going to cost you your head. It was going to kill you. It would kill Christians. And so, you know what? Maybe going there. And they went anyway, for the most part. Don't ditch the body. But encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. The faith, the faith, the body of doctrine handed down from the apostles and how crucial it was to the early church. There was the faith and then there was the day. That day when He comes back. The unbelievers face their judgments and the believers get to be with Jesus. But until that day, don't give up on this body. Don't do this. I'm a solo Christian. Any Star Wars fans here? You guys know how Han Solo got his name? Because he wanted to do it alone. And so they called him Solo. Han Solo needed Luke. Han Solo needed Chewbacca. We all need each other. So I would just challenge you in 2020, and, and as we return to Luke, and as we undergo this training, consider your role in the body of Christ at Compass Church in 2020. I have never, not that I'm like super, you know, experienced guy or whatever, but I have never seen a church that has the potential in front of it, especially with this new facility coming. And I, I just feel like we are poised, wonderfully positioned 
to do some really, really neat ministry. I've never seen a time where there's so many Christians that have walked away from church. And I think it's because of that masked room. Because not everyone who leaves the masked room goes to the room of grace. Some stay outside of both rooms. We are poised to be the church that would welcome and love unlike anything that I have ever seen. And I don't, I'm not judging others because I don't know these churches. But I'm just saying in here they would be welcome. In here they would be edified. And we just want to make sure that we're that church. So can I challenge you with this? And I'm going to pick back up on this in a few minutes in our business meeting. And you know what? At the same time, I think we're going to welcome three more into membership here, which is kind of cool too. So, Anyway, Father, we just thank you for your encouraging words to us uh, in the book of Ephesians, Father. And I just pray that all of us would consider our role in the body of Christ. And as much as I hate to even say this, that maybe this church isn't for everybody, but I know bouncing around and not being in a church at all is not good either. So for those that don't feel they want to be a part of something here, I I just pray they'd be a part of something somewhere because their walk with you and is so, so critical. But for those that want to be part of Compass Church, God, would you help us to see each other as absolutely vitally linked, joined together components <laughs> that are completely depended to, depended upon, and dedicated to one another. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.